Hi everybody, this is Mrs. Hansen, and welcome to AP Chemistry Video. Today, we are going to listen to a video about kinetic energy. So, gases. Obviously, gas particles move a lot. The movement of gas particles can be described by kinetic molecular theory. We're going to talk a lot about this, believe you me. But there are four ideas to kinetic molecular theory, and they're on page 215 in your book. You're definitely going to want to read that. But today we're only going to talk about one of those postulates, and that one is the one about kinetic energy. All right, you remember from ninth grade that kinetic energy is basically the energy of motion. Perfect. And I bet you also remember that if you increase the temp, you're going to increase the motion of the particles. All right, so pretty easy. First point, any two gases at the same temperature will have the same kinetic energy. Okay. But what really is kinetic energy? So let's look at the formula. It's one half m v squared. Well, of course, m stands for the mass of the particles. All right, great. V squared, which actually your textbook uses the symbol u, which is fine. V squared stands for the average square of the speed of the particles. So the keyword there is the v squared or the u. It's just totally related to the speed that the particles are traveling. Okay, so a take home message about kinetic energy is that it depends on both mass and speed. And I hope that totally makes sense. I want you to think about a really, really, really fast moving semi truck. Wow, when it hits the wall or whatnot, that's some serious force, serious energy. Now, if you take a little tiny, you know, smart car or something traveling that exact same speed, just not going to hit the wall with quite as much force because it doesn't have quite as much kinetic energy. So mass and speed both play a role in determining the kinetic energy. Okay, so let's see how to apply this. First of all, let's take a, a look at a sample of gases. You see these little tiny particles moving, right? At any one moment are all the gas particles traveling the exact same speed. So if you just watch that for a second, you might see that like this guy I can keep an eye on him. He's going really slow. But whoa, he just sped up. Right? At any given moment, some of the particles are moving fast, and some of them are moving really slow. And that's just because of how they collided or, you know, just kind of how they bounce off each other. Okay, that's fine. The key, though, is that if you considered the average speed of all the particles, or the average kinetic energy of all the particles, that's the key. That would be constant. Okay. So we'll jot that down. I have that down here. Oops, I'll bring it up. So are they all moving the same speed? No, some are moving fast, some are moving slow. But the key is, is that the average speed at a certain temperature is the same. Okay, great. So you know what? We have this really cool graph that illustrates this for us. This is called the Maxwell speed distribution curve. And this is a pretty important graph. We're actually going to come back to it a couple times throughout the year. So what is this really telling us? Well, first of all, I want you to notice that there's one, two, three different temperatures represented. And it's one sample of gas. So let's say 1,000 nitrogen molecules, okay? First thing you might notice is that as temperature increases, what happens to molecular speed? Well, you know that if you increase the temperature, the particles are going to move faster. How is that supported by this graph? Well, if you take a look, speed is on the x-axis. Right? And this is the number of particles that happen to be going at that particular speed. So what's really important is can you pinpoint the average speed that the gases are traveling in these samples? So for the red line here at zero degrees, this is actually the average speed that the particles are traveling. Some are traveling faster, some are traveling slower, but the bulk of particles are traveling at this average speed. Likewise, if you take a look at the green line, well, now we've sped the particles up. So the average speed is faster. So it's basically the height of that curve. Now, of course, some particles are moving faster. Some particles are moving slower. But the average speed that those particles are traveling has increased. And likewise, the same thing for the 2000. Well, you know, what's weird about that is why does the curve flatten as you go from low speed or low temperature, excuse me, to high temperature? Well, you know, that just has to do with sort of a statistical thing, you know? I mean, if you're, if you got a lot more possible speeds, like at 2,000 degrees, some of them are going really fast, and some of them are going really slow. So there's a lot of possible temperatures in between. 
So because there's so much variability, so many different possible speeds that the particles could be going, that's why the curve appears to be flat. That really has nothing to do with the essential information. The basic idea is that as you increase the temperature, the average speed of the particles does indeed increase. So going back to this question, as temperature increases, molecular speed becomes more variable. Why? There's more possible speeds at higher temperatures. Okay? So we're going to come back to this graph, but I think that hopefully it gives you sort of the gist. I'll remind you guys of one more thing, though. Looking at the y-axis, just remember that this represents the number of particles. Okay? Sometimes it's easy to forget that. All right. Now uh, let's talk about two different gases. So let's say we're talking about two gases. Oh, I'm sorry. First of all, two gases at the same temperature. Now, because they're at the same temperature, what absolutely has to be the same for them? Because they're at the same temperature, they should, I don't know why I said should, they have the same kinetic energy. Because really, when it comes down to it, temperature measures kinetic energy, average kinetic energy. Okay, but do their molecules necessarily travel at the same average speed? Okay, so that's the key. So you guys might remember this from um, last year. Oop, that's a real messy no. That if you're a heavy gas particle, so your mass is really high, I like to think of those big, huge bumblebees, you know, those really, really huge ones that super loud. I mean, they come at you and they're just moving ridiculously slow. So they're really big, so therefore they travel slow, their speed is slow, okay? And likewise, the little tiny bees that move super fast, little tiny guys that have a small mass, so they move super fast. But just keep in mind that even though they're two different particles, they, they're at the same temperature, they have the same kinetic energy. Okay, so I want to remind you guys of a demonstration that you did last year in regular chemistry. So you guys did it in a straw, and you had NH3 on a cotton ball, or actually I think it might have been a Q-tip on one side. And then you had HCl on another Q-tip on the other side, and it was like a molecular race. So the little tiny gas particles left each Q-tip, and then it was a race to see where they met. Okay, And maybe, much to your surprise, the two gases did not meet in the middle, but rather they met closer to the HCl side. Okay, So why did that happen? Well, these two gases were at the same temperature, correct? But which one had a greater mass? So the HCl had a greater mass, so therefore it traveled more slowly. So therefore, this guy traveled a lot more quickly, and they met not in the middle. Okay? So I wanted to remind you guys about this experiment that you did. Uh, when gases gradually mix, so basically, you know, you start one on one side, one on the other side, and they mix, that's called diffusion. Gaseous diffusion. You know, the reason why my handwriting is so terrible is because Ms. Schneider and I used to have these fancy airliners, and let's just say that they totally have broken, so it's a little bit difficult to do this revised video, but we're getting new ones, so rest assured it'll get fixed. Okay, anyway, moving on, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so now we're going to actually put some numbers to all this stuff. So quantifying gaseous diffusion. You can calculate the actual speed that particles travel. So this is going back to that um, mu or that v value. This, If you take the square root of that v squared, if you take square root, we call that the u or the v RMS. RMS stands for root mean squared, so the square root of that number. Okay, and you guys see this, you know, this fancy dancy formula. We are not going to worry about how that formula came about, but your book actually talks about, um, you know, all the factors that went into that, and it's pretty interesting, so in your book you can read about that. Uh, but for us, we, we're going to use this formula, but really, you know, we don't use this formula too often because it's not very realistic. So if you use this formula, you'd see that the velocity of gas particles is usually on the order of like 600 to 1600 meters per second. And folks, that's like 1300 to 4000 miles per hour. So I mean, gas particles are cruising, they're moving pretty fast. By the way, little FYI. We are going to use this formula a little bit, and this R is not the normal R. It's what I call energy R, okay, which ends up being 8.314. And when you solve, you can look up the units. Temperature in Kelvin, and the molar mass, as it turns out, has to be in kilograms. Okay, and That's all going to come out when you actually do some of the practice problems in the book. So we'll get to that later. All right, now, like I said, 
just we don't really care about the actual speed that gas particles are traveling because they don't really travel that speed. Why? Because when they're trying to move quickly, they're going through air, air gets in the way, and basically with all the extra collisions that occur, gas particles travel actually significantly slower than this. So what do we care about? Well, we actually like to compare how much fast this gas particle moves versus this one, more of a comparison, and that's what Graham's Law accomplishes for us. Okay, so the bottom line with Graham's Law is that I want to remind you that if your mass is high, okay, so if you're really heavy, then you're going to travel low. Okay, that is a classic inverse relationship. So when we represent Graham's Law, it's, you know, it's exactly that, it's a proportion, but it's an inverse relationship. Okay, and it has that square feature in it as well. So if we have, let's say, the molar mass of substance 1, and it's going to be diagonal from the rate of that substance, okay, and vice versa. And that's just so we can represent an inverse relationship. So we're going to see how to use this formula in just a minute. Okay, so here's an example where I'd love to see if we stop right now, stop, pause the video, and just go ahead and try to work this formula through, work it out, and see if you can get the same answer that I get. Okay? So just to get you started, it says the diffusion rate of an unknown gas. So that's one of the reasons why we use Graham's Law. Is it's another way to solve for molar mass. And as we talked about before, molar mass is a way that we can identify gases. Because really, they kind of all look the same. Okay, But molar mass distinguishes them. So the diffusion rate of an unknown gas is measured and found to be 31.5 milliliters per minute, volume per minute. Under identical experimental conditions, the diffusion rate of O2 is found to be 30.5 milliliters per minute. Here are my choices. Identify the gas. Okay. So um, when you set up the formula, let's get you guys started, 31.50 milliliters per minute. Now just keep in mind, is that the is that the oxygen or is that the gas you're looking for? Okay, that's the unknown gas, so we're gonna put its molar mass, what we're looking for, on the bottom diagonal plane. Okay? And then uh, the oxygen 30.50 the units in, and that's going to go with the O2. It's going to go on top. So two oxygens, which is diatomic, 30. Okay, so you guys got the general setup. So you can go ahead and crunch those numbers and see what you get for the molar mass. All right, with the work, I just wanted to remind you that, you know, obviously you can totally cross multiply, so 30.50 times the square root of 32. Just don't lose track of that 32. That's the most common mistake I see. And then divided by this, okay, that's fine. Uh, but then you got, you're solving, you got basically the square root of m2 equals this. Don't forget to get rid of the square root, which means square both sides. So the molar mass comes out to about 30. All right, well, looking at my choices, the only one that matches 30 is going to be the NO. Okay, 14 plus 16, the two molar masses. So that's one way we use Graham's laws to solve for the molar mass to identify some kind of unknown gas. So this is an experimental setup that you can Okay, well that one's just peachy. Moving on, gaseous effusion, totally the same thing. I mean, it's the same exact formula. The only difference is that the experiment is going to take place in an evacuated container. Okay, so what that means, no air. So as a result, you get much, much, much more accurate results with gaseous effusion. But bottom line, more or less the same thing. Okay. So, again, I want you guys to take a look at this example. Calculate the ratio of the fusion rates of hydrogen gas and uranium hexafluoride, a gas used in the enrichment process to produce blah, 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 fuel for nuclear reactors. Okay, so I gave you the molar mass for the uranium hexafluoride. My only tip with this one is that you want your ratio to be, like, not a decimal, but be a number greater than one. So what that means, if that's the case, you want the fast one on top, at least in terms of rate, and the slow one on the bottom. So between uranium hexafluoride and hydrogen, who's the fast one? I hope you said hydrogen. So we'll put the hydrogen on top, and then we'll put the hexafluoride on the bottom. So when you set up your molar masses, just remember they're going to be diagonal. So that means hydrogen's on the bottom, and then the uranium hexafluoride is in the top here to create that lovely inverse relationship. Okay, so pause and go ahead and solve and see what you get. Are you working on it? I said pause it. Why didn't you pause it? Okay, got the problem done. Any more time? Just pause it. Let's see what you got. How about about 13.2? Okay.
Okay, so did you remember that hydrogen's diatomic? Did you remember the square root? Okay, and that these, you got them inversely related. So basically hydrogen would defuse or diffuse, really, 13.2 times faster than uranium hexafluoride. All right, see, this stuff is fun. I love it. Okay, uh, let's see. There's one more example. Oh, oh yeah, I love this one. So this time I'm going to give you just a little tip here. It says the time required for a volume of unknown gas to infuse through a pinhole and evacuate a flask was 71.5 seconds. Now we're dealing with time, not with rate. And I want you to think about this. It says time equal rate. So let's say I'm a really big heavy molecule like that, uranium hexafluoride, right? So I'm a really big molecule, so I'm going to move slow. So if I have to travel from your house to the high school, and I'm really slow, it's going to take me a long time, okay? So what that means is big size, big mass, that's an arrow by the way, means long time. So that means big time. See, so, ooh, that's a direct relationship, okay? Which, just to throw this in, in the mix, means a slow rate. Okay, well, that's interesting. So if they just give you time values, that makes it sort of interesting to solve. So what you can do is you can handle this one of two different ways. Um, if you want to, you know, you can use the times and just kind of convert them to a rate, um, you know, because rate is basically how far you traveled per unit time. So you can just say, well, we all traveled like one mile per 63 seconds. Well, and then we traveled the same distance for the other guy per 71.5 seconds. That's fine. Then you can set it up just the same way as Graham law, Graham's law. Or if you want to, if you think you can keep two relationships in your head, you can try this guy. This is Graham's law, but in terms of time, not rate. So in other words, it's just a ratio. Just a classic proportion, nothing fancy about it, nothing tricky about it. Uh, if it's a big molecule, it's going to take a long time to diffuse or diffuse. Okay, it still has the square root relationship in there as well. So uh, that's what I'd like you guys to finish up with is I want you to you try either method, uh, but the bottom line, I want you guys to have that answer worked out. And uh, if you have any questions, we will certainly take a look at them uh, when we have the opportunity to do so in class. Thanks very much for listening and have a great life. Thank you very much. Mathan